Lord, give us wisdom and humility as we read your word and help us to trust more dearly in your son, Jesus. Amen. Well, friends, across term three, we're going to be looking at in detail at Genesis 12 to 50, looking at the children of the promise. Uh, But what we're doing today and next week is we're getting a bit of a prequel kind of moment. Uh, This week, we're going to be looking and getting a bit of a summary of what's happened in Genesis 1 to 3. Uh, In two weeks' time, we're going to be looking at Genesis 4 to 11. uh, And we're going to have kind of NADOC week is sort of happening in the middle. Uh, So today, we're going to be looking at Genesis 1 to 3, and we're going to be thinking about it in terms of four categories. I've put an outline here. It's got lots of writing in it. Uh, just to kind of give you a bit of a vibe of where we're going and, and uh, where we're going through it. I promise you uh, none of these categories are going for a, uh, for a long time. Otherwise, it'll be a, like a three-hour sermon. Uh, but And we're not doing that. Um, but the details are in there, and hopefully there's uh, some room for you to keep filling things in as we go. But there's a lot to cover, so let's get stuck in. So the first question is, Genesis, what on earth are we reading Uh, So the question firstly is, who is this written to? Well, it's a message which is both specific and also general. It's a message which is for everyone, but it's also a message to a specific people at a specific time. Uh, Originally, it was likely written down by Moses uh, around 1800 BC, and it was firstly for the people of Israel. But it is also a message that is for everyone. You see, you and I get to listen in on what God was teaching them. And as we listen in, we too get to know God through what he teaches. Uh, So what is this a message that is written about? Well, Genesis is a book which is written first and foremost so that you and I might know God. It is all about who God reveals himself to be. And this is the case because we don't simply look around the world and go, ah, there is God and there is God. No, God is outside our world. And so what we need for us to know God is that God might reveal himself to us. And that is exactly what God does in the book of Genesis. He reveals himself to us. Uh, In terms of literary style that we're reading here, it's worth noting the first chapter is a poem and then it switches and the second chapter and third chapter follow a more kind of narrative style of accounts. Uh, And these three chapters, they are critical in setting up not just the book of Genesis so that we might understand it, but actually the whole story of the Bible. You see, these chapters are critical for us to get right, uh, because if we get them wrong, then we're going to fundamentally misunderstand what God has to say about topics like our identity, sexuality, gender, marriage, work, rest, start of life, end of life, human dignity, the environment, cosmology, evil, suffering, human relationships, our nature, role and purpose in life. You know, the small items of that kind of consume our thinking from now and time to time. You see, Genesis 1 to 3 provides actually a critical footprint for all of these topics, uh, which are then developed right through the whole Bible, and we understand them most clearly in the work and person of Jesus. But if we get them wrong at the beginning, then it has actually huge consequences later on for how we then think about things. So... What do these chapters teach? Let's start in Genesis 1. And Genesis 1 firstly introduces us to God, who is the God over everything. Uh, Look from Genesis 1.1. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Uh, God is the creator of the heavens and the earth. Uh, God was there before the earth had form. You see that in verse 2. God was there before there was anything. Uh, And into this reality, God speaks. Uh, Look from verse 3. It says, uh, God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and morning the first day. 
Uh, and this continues as God makes all of the realms, uh, light, earth, water and sky. And then he fills these realms with appropriate things that belong to it. Uh, suns and moon for light, animals on the earth, fish in the water, birds in the air. Now, it's worth saying at this point, these are really ancient categories for thinking about things. They are not the categories that you and I use for understanding our world now. But God is using here language and a way of understanding uh, that would have been helpful to the Israelites whom he was speaking to. You see, God is not concerned about advancing people's cosmologies. God doesn't correct the categories that, that they're using there and say, no, guys, look, fish are kind of fish creatures, whatever that is. Um, he instead uses language that actually helps the people he is speaking to to understand who he, he is, that he is the God who is actually over everything, like every, every, everything. Uh, he reveal, And what is it that God reveals about himself? Well, he reveals that he is a speaking God. You see, God speaks creation into existence. For us, that feels like an odd way of describing things. Uh, when we talk about making stuff, what do we talk about using? Our hands. We make things with our hands. When we speak, well, that's how we reveal things about ourselves. We talk uh, and reveal things about ourselves by our speech. Uh, what God does here he does in creation, he speaks and creation happens. What God is doing is he is revealing what he is like through the creation that he has made. And what he reveals is that he and his creation are good. Every time we go through this pattern and cycle, God looks on his creation and it is good. After he creates people, it is very good. God is not just this neutral kind of builder. He is a God who is good to his core. And we see in this that God is also a God of order. Now, this is a very calm account of creation. It is very ordered how the world was made. Uh, God is in charge of every single system and every single object that is made. We see here that God is a God who is supreme. Everything is made by God. There is nothing which exists outside of God that is not under his supreme creation. We see in it also that God is a God who cares for his creation. You see, God is in charge of everything that he has made, but he cares for it. You see, as he makes these things, he assesses it and he declares them to be good. You see, this is not a God who just kind of makes stuff and then moves on. It's like my children, they do their drawings, they make their things and then whoom, they're out of there and all the mess in the toy room exists. Just like your, room, your, your uh, lounge room there, Michael. Uh, God is not like that. God cares intimately for the things that he has made and especially for the people that he has made at the pinnacle of his creative effort. You see, God is revealing himself to the people of Israel uh, that he is extremely different to the gods who are worshipped in all of the polytheistic societies around Israel at the time. You see, for those societies, uh, the world of the gods is chaos. One god fights another god and suddenly they think that there's kind of, you know, volcanoes erupt and things go bad and chaos overflows into the human world as a result. Uh, creation and the powerful acts of the earth happens as one god defeats another. For them, the gods are ambivalent towards humans. They couldn't care less. And human's job we're just got to try and stay on their good side uh, or, get, or we're going to find ourselves getting caught in their way. To be a human in those societies at the time is to be helpless, to be at the whim of capricious, erratic, 
unconcerned gods of this pantheon that they worship, hoping that they're going to survive tomorrow. Friends, the one true God reveals himself to be completely different. God speaks and he actually shows us what he's like in his creation. God is supremely in charge. There is nothing and there is no one who might challenge him. He is good. He is ordered. His creation is calm. God is not indifferent or impersonal. He is active and he is gracious and he is caring and he is personal as a creator who loves his creation. And friends, that should be such a relief to us because we are not nothings, but we are loved by our creator. We are not helplessly at the whim of gods who might be in power today, but gone tomorrow. But God is the same today as he was yesterday, as he will be forevermore. For the polytheists, the gods cause chaos uh, and they, it intrudes in their lives and they're helpless against it. Uh, and they just try and build order to maybe just keep things in check. But for us, while we might experience chaos in our world, and there's going to be more on that in chapter 3, our God is a God of order and peace, which means that for you and I, as we feel the chaos, we can rest in our God. We can find comfort in our God. We, we don't have to build our own order. God does that, and he does that for us. What God reveals of himself in Genesis 1 is something profound. God is the God who is over everything. Uh, but as we move into Genesis 2, the tone shifts a bit. Uh, we move from this giant picture of God's global creative power to focus in on one garden and particularly God's relationship with one of his creation, humanity. Uh, we see in verse 7 that God breathes into man's nostrils and he gives him life. Uh, but it's not just air that God is using, uh, that, God, that God is speaking about here. Uh, the Hebrew account uses the word ruach, which is just a great word to say, just in general conversation. Uh, but it means spirit. God breathes spirit into the man. Uh, God makes humans, but he makes them personally, and he breathes into them spirit in a way that is distinct from all of his other creations. And God continues to show that he knows what his humans need. In verse 8 and 9, God builds a garden home for Adam, full of food, full of water, full of beauty. Uh, later on, we'll see that, that Adam needs companionship. And God provides for him. Uh, we see that humans, that they are fully known by God. And that God provides all that we need. But it's not just that God knows everything there is to know about humans and kind of stays at a distance. No, God actually uh, makes, uh, makes the relationship with us such that we are to know him in return. A sneaky little detail that's there in verse 7, uh, where God is introduced, you see the word Lord there in capitals. In the Bible, that is the, uh, that is, uh, the word Yahweh, the name for God, uh, which he reveals to his people. Uh, God makes him known, himself known personally to humanity. Uh, later in chapter 3, we're going to see that God even walks around the garden in the afternoon uh, with his humans. You see, God doesn't just know us and stay at a distance. No, God wants to be known by us too. Uh, and without saying anything earth shattering here, uh, this actually has an enormous implications for what it means to be a human. Because if being a human is fundamentally about knowing God and being known by God, uh, then this becomes the basis from which we develop 
um, our understanding of human dignity and self-worth. The fundamental question, who am I, is answered here in Genesis 2. I am fundamentally someone who is known by God and I am made to know God. We're made to be in relationship with God. That is who we are. Uh, but the passage continues, uh, to know God is to acknowledge him as the one who is supreme over all things. And so in verse 15, God sets the ground rules for humans. Don't eat from the tree of knowledge, uh, the knowledge of good and evil in the middle of the garden, but every other tree, including the tree of life, that's fair game. God gives humanity boundaries. And in the same, uh, same verse, God gives people purpose. Adam, in verse 15, is given the role of tending to God's garden. Uh, this command looks a lot like the creative output that God has been pouring on Adam. Uh, God uh, makes and he orders and he does so for the good of Adam. And so Adam is called to, uh, to order and to look after the good of the things that have been placed under his authority. Uh, this is a good exercising of authority where humans, like God, are called to order and shape things and to care for the things that are under our charge. God has authority over humans and he pours his love out to us and we submit to his love. Uh, and then in turn, we exercise authority over the things that God has placed under us. Uh, but we see there in verse 18 that we're introduced to the first non-good as well, uh, as God observes that man needs a suitable helper for companionship. So in verse 21, uh, God takes a rib from Adam, uh, something that is from Adam himself, uh, and God forms Eve as the perfect helper and companion for Adam. Uh, and there is so much which is critical to say about the nature of men and women from this section. I'm just going to take a little aside to deal with that. The first thing we see is that Eve is from Adam. Uh, and so she is an inheritor of the special relationship that God has with Adam. You see, the animals... They were unsuitable because they didn't have the ruach, the, the spirit breathed into them. Only Adam had that. And so Eve, made from Adam, is also someone who has that spirit-filled relationship with God. She is made to inherit all of those same blessings just as Adam did. Adam and Eve were equal in promise before God. The second thing that we see here is that Eve is also distinct from Adam. She is different to him, and her role as helper is intended to be complementary to the role that Adam played, that together they would exercise the dominion over God's creation, but that they would play two distinct roles within this. Adam and Eve, equal in promise, and yet they are different and designed to be complementary to each other. Third, the role of Eve, which is given here as helper, is not subservience. And this is important to say. When we hear the word helper, what do we think? We think boss, underling is kind of the helper, yeah? That's how we think. That is not what is, that kind of hierarchical language is not actually present in this word in its usage in the, in the Old Testament. In fact, the same word is used in both Psalm 33 and Psalm 118 to positively talk about God as the helper of Israel. Now, God's not subservient to Israel, is he? I want no, I want no's, no, no. God is, Israel is not the boss of God. No, that is not how it works. And so what we're not seeing here, uh, Eve is given responsibility of helper, uh, but she is not subservient to Adam. There's no hierarchy that is found in that word, uh, in this usage here. Instead, they're together. Um, Adam has responsibility to lead, uh, Eve is alongside, 
Uh, they're they're complementary uh, and there's mutuality in that. They are to be loved and to love, to serve and be served. Adam does have the responsibility to leave, but he doesn't have it with hierarchy. Uh, Eve is given responsibility as helper, but not at all with any sense of subservience. Fourth, we see that people need companionship. The problem in verse 18 was that Adam was alone. Now, the global solution here is not find a wife or husband. Uh, Adam and Eve were the first humans, and yes, they were male and female, and yes, they got married and they had babies and all of that. But the problem that there is there in verse 18 is that Adam was alone. And so single, dating, married, widowed, divorced, or otherwise, God made people to be the companions of other people. We need relationships together. And that's critical to say. Uh, finally, we should note that this chapter ends with Adam and Eve, they're nuding it up in the garden and they felt no shame. They felt no shame. Now that's an almost impossible thing for us to imagine. Life without guilt or worry, without the need to hide our flaws, uh, without needing to hide our imperfections from other people or from God. <sighs> chapter, two, uh, chapter 2 shows us that God made, uh, uh, made humanity to have a special bond with him. He knows us. We were made to know him. He gives us dignity in this relationship. He provides for our needs. He gives us boundaries and purpose. He gives us companionship and distinctness in our humanness, male and female, complementary, truly equal and yet distinct, and there is no shame. And friends, I must say what a difference chapter 3 makes to that story that we see there. Because as we roll into chapter 3, and we'll be brief here, evil enters the world. The serpent convinces Adam and Eve, uh, it convinces Eve and Adam there with her, uh, that God was holding out on them, that, that in disobeying God, they would find true knowledge and true power. He promises them that they would be like God in chapter 3, verse 5. Eve ate. Adam was there with her. Adam ate too. Humanity, we rebelled against God. And evil enters the world and there is immediate impact. Adam and Eve, they, they feel shame. They feel shame and they're trying to cover themselves with leaves and things. They try and hide from God in the trees. But the God who has authority over them, he finds them and he calls them to account. And in it, we see this great disordering of sin. You see, instead of listening to God and exercising loving dominion over creation, Eve instead listened to the snake. She listened to creation and, in, and failed to listen to God and instead asserted her dominion over God's rules and boundaries of, over her. Instead of listening to God and leading his wife in exercising dominion over creation, Adam listened to his wife and not God. He is passive where he, he had been called to be active in loving and leading and responding to the authority of God. Instead of respecting the authority of God, the serpent sought to overthrow God's authority twisting God's words as he sought to manipulate God's people. All three parties are guilty, and all three parties receive judgment in response to their sin. To the serpent, the devil, well, we see that he is brought low. The serpent now is forced onto his belly, eating the dust. The devil, the agent of sin, is made shameful, and lowly uh, to Adam and Eve. You see, they were supposed to be fruitful and multiply. Uh, they were supposed to subdue the earth. 
Well, that task is now hard. To Eve, there is now pain in childbearing. Sometime this week, I may well be seeing the experience of that as we await our child, uh, child that is coming very, very, very soon. Uh, to Adam, there will be fruitlessness as the earth resists him in subduing it. Uh, and eventually we see that the earth actually then swallows him in death. Between them as a pair, there will be a grappling for power. No longer are they shameless. Uh, no longer are they a united front that they were, but instead there is a quest for power between them. You see, God's commands to them remain, but their attempts are now met with hardship and with opposition. But the main thing that we see in this chapter is the chaos uh, that has happened to God's created order. You see, every single thing that was ordered in chapter 2 is then turned over in disorder in chapter 3. Humans were meant to rule creation, and yet the snake asserts his authority over people. Adam was supposed to lead his wife, and instead he listened to her and is led astray. Just want to pause here, guys. Listen to your wives, but listen to God first and foremost. Uh, Adam and Eve, they were supposed to sit under God's authority. But instead, they decided to assert their authority over God. Everything that was ordered is now just chaos because of the sinfulness of humanity. That's the cause. And this is so fundamentally different to the understanding of the people in the nations around Israel. And it's so fundamentally different to the understanding that the people in our society have today. For the people in the ancient world, they saw this world in chaos and they blamed the gods. And they thought that humans, we were just trying to bring good by our just small endeavours of ordering and making things work. Well, today, we don't blame the gods, but we look around at the chaos and we blame history. Or we blame a particular people or a culture or a race or an ideal. We blame nationalism. Uh, we blame another political party. We blame everything out there except for me. And so our culture strives to strike out at whatever individuals deem to be evil. And so there is a rallying of minds. Uh, there's a cancelling. There's shutting down of anything that they can determine for themselves to be evil. And friends, this is just people striving, hoping to make a better world. But they miss the problem. Both our modern friends and the ancient world, they miss the problem. Because the problem is us. The problem is not out there. The problem is all of us. We are the ones who bring the chaos. We are the ones who ignore the one true God who made and ordered this whole world. Every single one of us, we're, we're not part of the solution. We're the problem. But chapter 3 here, it leaves us with just a glimmer of hope. Just a glimmer. Firstly, we see that God shows mercy. Death enters the world, but Adam and Eve are not immediately obliterated. Instead, God graciously clothes them. Even as he is sending them out of his presence in the garden, God does not stop caring for his humans. And likewise, we are left with a promise spoken into this now chaotic world of people who are listening to the serpent. The promise that God gives is that there will be one from the line of humans who will crush the serpent, who will crush the devil, who will destroy sin and the death that it brings. Friends, as we read John 1 early on, I hope that you heard 
elements of all of these first three chapters of Genesis ringing out as we are introduced to Jesus. Jesus was the Word, uh, and the Word was with, uh, was with God. The Word was God. He was God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Jesus was there in the beginning. He is fully God, God who is supreme over all things. And as the supreme God, what does he do? Verse 14, the Word becomes flesh, and he made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory. The glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of truth and grace. And what does Jesus come to do? You see it in verse 10. Jesus, the human, steps in our world to save all who would believe in him and receive him. From verse 10 in John 1, Jesus was in the world and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his, world, his own did not receive him. And yet, to all who do receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gives the right to become children of God. Friends, as we hear the magnificence of creation, as we hear the prominence of humanity, as we hear the chaos of the unrelenting sin of this world, know that God always has had a plan. That plan is Jesus. That plan is that you and I might receive Jesus, that we might trust him, that we might believe in what he does to defeat sin and death, and that you and I, by trusting in him, might find hope and life that we might be restored to be children of God. How about I pray, because I want to pray for each of you, that you might be trusting in exactly that. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, you made all things, and you made us to be your delight, and yet, Lord, we turned away from you and chose to rule ourselves. We thank you so much for Jesus, that he comes into this world that we may be saved. And I pray for each one of us here that we might receive him, that we might trust and follow him, and that we as a whole congregation might encourage one another to do so. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.